continue our discussion on instruction scheduling and hopefully we will get time to touch some of the programming on modern processors. But uh, before we start, it's always a good idea to remind ourselves where we are coming from. So today uh, we are talking about data hazard, but before we ha also uh, we also talk about structural hazard and control hazard. Structural hazard is the case where we don't have uh, uh, enough functional units to serve the demand of two concurrent instructions in the pipeline. 
And control hazard is the case where we just don't know where is the next instruction that we can fetch from. And data hazard is the case that, well, the instruction is right there, functional units is available, but we just don't have uh, data that, uh, that's ready for us to process. So we have been talking about uh, modifying the hardware design to address the demand of uh, to address the issue of structural hazard. For control hazard, we spend a lot of time in dynamic branch predictions, and today we are going to continue our discussion on uh, resolving data hazard with dynamic instruction scheduling. So previously, we have been talking about uh, we can use data forwarding uh, to address uh, uh, data hazards. However, that only give you one uh, or a few cycles that's very uh, minor improvement. And in fact, there are a lot of opportunities that we are missing here is that, well, we have multiple functional units. So that's why we started a discussion of superscatter that allows us to fetch and decode multiple instructions at the same time. And because of that, you have multiple instructions that you can choose from your decoded instructions so that you can concurrently execute instruction to improve um, the 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 head, uh, the the uh, parallelism among instructions, which further make more use of your functional units. And with super scanner, you can imagine the theoretical CPI that you can get here is either one over your is one over uh, your minimum of your issue width, patch width, decode width. Uh, so, um, so in theory, if you have a two issue pipeline with uh, the ability to decode or issue. Uh, uh, De uh, decode or fetch two instructions at the same time, the theoretical CPI is now 1 over 2, which is 0 0.5. So uh, we have been talking about, okay, if we have a perfect branch predictor, here's what we can do with uh, superscalar scheduling. However, uh, there are still issues here. So for example, at the cycle 3, uh, you are actually allowing to, uh, so uh, you are actually having uh, um, uh, instructions you can well actually as cycle four and uh, as cycle sorry as cycle four and cycle ten uh, right now your memory unit is free however we still cannot start uh, instructions six and eleven because they are not even in uh, they are not decoded yet and because uh, we have limited issue with. Right. Or here, everything we need for instruction four is already ready uh, at this time. However, we still cannot execute it because of the head of line blocking issue. So uh, there are a lot. So 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 our idea is that we want to schedule instructions uh, regardless of their order, as long as the reordering won't cause issues in the correctness of your program. However. Uh, we saw that should be the case, but because there are instructions, a later instruction may override the source register of an earlier instruction, or overrides the output of an earlier uh, uh, of an earlier uh, instruction. So it turns out that even though they don't have true data dependency, we still cannot reschedule them. So these are the false dependencies we have. And some of you might say, why don't we just use compiler to reorder those instructions? But the reality is that, for example, SAE 6 only has 16 registers. And you have just this limited number of registers, and the compiler would like to use them as much as possible to avoid memory accesses. So compilers are also limited by uh, the registers exposed by this instruction set architecture. And the other thing is that, um, a lot of optimization that we have been talking about uh, uh, in uh, a, a lot of potential optimization that we have been talking about is based on that we know the next iteration is going to be executed. However, there is no way compiler can see that because compiler can only see one basic block and it cannot predict the next iter iteration is going to be taken. So those are the limitations of compilers. So that's why we need all the other dynamic instruction scheduling. 
So uh, the most popular instruct dynamic instruction scheduling mechanism is actually coming from the paper that assigned in the reading the MIPS R10K superscalar processor. And the mechanism here is called register renaming and speculative execution. So we mentioned that we do have false dependencies. And the reason we have false dependency is just because a later instruction overrides the register of an earlier instruction. So if we give each output a new register, if we give each output a new register or new temporary storage, we are going to solve the problem. Do you agree with that? So here, I give you an example. If we can have more registers, for example, if um, for the left-hand side sequence, if I can rewrite it as, as the right-hand side, so for example, whenever I have a new output here, for example, for RDI, I just put it in T0. And for this ENX output, I put it in T1. For this RDI, right, uh, well, so this is the source, right? So for this RDI, because the previous one is now in T0, so then I can just compare with T0 instead of RDI instead. Right, so if you can rewrite your instruction sequence like this, you will figure out there is not all the all the false dependencies are gone. All the false dependencies are gone. Right? So that's actually the idea of register renaming. Right? So uh, and another thing that we want to enable the chance of optimization. Right, so one thing hardware can do better than the software is that the software cannot predict what would happen in the future. However, the hardware could. So um, the, the, the idea of uh, hardware dynamic scheduling is that we leverage the fact that there is something called branch predictors inside the processor. So we, we try to reorder instructions that branch prediction uh, give us and then uh, however, right, branch may mispredict, and exception can occur anytime, which causes your control flow to, uh, to change. So we still need to maintain the order of instruction in some way. At least we know that, okay, if those instructions that we predicted are not going to happen, then we have a way to uh, revert the change that we have made. So this uh, this kind of execution policy is called uh, speculative execution. So for a speculative execution is that we allow the hardware to schedule instructions across branch instructions uh, with the help of branch predictions. And um, so um, whenever we execute, right, we put the, is we, uh, if, the branch, if there is a branch that is not resolved yet, or if there is an instruction before you that hasn't been done yet, those are all speculative execution. So before your instructions becomes non-speculative, we are going to store your result in a temporary buffer called reorder buffer. So that's the idea of uh, speculative execution. So if your instruction is still in the reorder buffer, is not really presented to outside of the world. So as long as something happened, for example, we identify there is a branch misprediction, we identify there is an exception, then we are going to discard all the execution outcome that is in the reorder buffer. So that's the idea of speculative execution. So uh, to to uh, so for you the easiest way to understand it is that okay so the processor itself has a temporary so you can consider the processor is creating a parallel world uh, when it's doing the speculative execution. However, if we found something is wrong in the real world, then we are going to discard everything from the parallel world and restart from the real world. So that's what the illusion that the hardware would like to create. And the whole mechanism is called speculative execution. Right, so it's pretty much like, okay, so there are always a lot of consequences. Uh, there are, well, so you know, before, every day you are making a lot of decisions, right? And every time something is happening. 
And a lot of us, including me, we will think about, huh, what's going to be happening in the future, right? So I want to make plan. And in my plan, I already dream a lot, right? Like, what if, uh, what if today we go on a date, right? What if, uh, what happened in a date, right? And if this happened, what's the next step? Right, and it turns out that you know, uh, I got a phone. Okay, I'm not free tonight, so everything get canceled. Right, so you have to restart from uh, from from the real world. Otherwise, it will go with your plan. Right, so pretty much like this, the speculative institution is that okay, I predict this is going to happen, and based on this is happening, I speculatively executed this instructions, and in case the world is really uh, following the script that I uh, predicted, then all the results that I generated will be applied to the real world so that I can save time. But in case there's anything wrong in the real world, I would scratch all, uh, scrap all the things that is speculated still and go back to the real world and restart it from there. So that's the idea of speculative execution. And the other thing is called register renaming, right? As we said, the biggest obstacle that prevents us from um, freely dynamic execution is because we have the situation that a later instruction may overwrite a register that an early instruction is depending on. So what we really need is that we have to rename this register to some of the temporary registers. Right? So this mechanism is called register renaming. So uh, with this idea, right, how, how, so uh, the idea of register renaming is that, okay, my processor will internally provide a lot of uh, uh, architectural registers that are not visible to the rest of the world. And uh, with that, I can actually, um, um, I can actually uh, rename the, ins the instructions register output on the fly. And then uh, all the instructions following that renamed instruction would gather uh, the source register from the renamed instruction instead of, a, uh, instead of a, um, the real architecture registers. And as long as the instruction sequence is correct, then all the results are convincing. So that's the idea of register renaming. And okay, so now uh, let me show you how register renaming would work. So again, this is the same uh, idea of uh, institution diagram that we have. So for this institution diagram, this is uh, this direction is the cycle or the time, and this direction is the number of is the pipelines uh, elements that we have. So we have instruction fetch decode, and now a renaming state which is the logic that rename the architectural register to uh, a, 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 a physical register in your processor. And there are, again, we have four stages of pipeline for uh, memory, and there is also um, LU and um, uh, MUL unit as well as branch unit. And now we assume, again, this is still a super scalar processor that we have. So only two of uh, the memory unit or LU or M MUL unit or the branch unit can have instructions uh, being executed or being issued at the same time. So only two out of this four can have the instructions at the same cycle. So that's the, that's the idea. And whenever your instruction is still uh, speculated, we put it in the real buffer. So that's the idea. So now, let's fast forward a little bit and we are in cycle four. So at cycle three, we already get instruction one and two renamed. So if that's the case, right, and again, we have physical register, right, which, which would rename the architectural register to some of the internal register that the processor has. And then uh, here is also a table tell you if the physical register is in use or if it contains the, uh, the value that is valid for uh, other instructions to use. So right now, 
let's go through this sequence of instruction. So for uh, the next cycle, right? For the next cycle, so right now, assuming a cycle three, we decoded instruction one and two, right? What happened in the next cycle if for instruction one and two? Where is instruction one going? Can we issue it? Where are we going to put instruction one? M1, right? The memory unit. How about instruction two? LU, right? So next cycle, we are able to have instruction one and two in um, M1 and LU and keep decoding and renaming other instructions and fetching. Um, okay, here we should have seven and eight, right? Okay, so, but in the meantime, when we do register remaining, don't forget, we are giving the output of instruction one and two a new register. So in fact, instruction one and two, their output will be two new registers called P1 and P2. So here we can have a table telling you that well, ECX is now pointing to P1 and RDI is pointing to P2. And you can see that, well, assuming that we have 10 physical registers and P1 is in use, P2 is in use, however, uh, their values are not valid, right? Okay, then in the next cycle, right? Oh, okay, sorry. In the next cycle, right, what would happen? In the next cycle, what would happen? What happened to instruction one and two? One goes to M. One goes to M two. And how about instruction two? How many cycles we need for ALU? Just one cycle, right? So what are we going to do? What? No, it's a different thing, right? Where are you going to do, do it? When you are done with the instruction, what are you going to do? Write back, but we don't have write back now, right? What's that? We have a reorder buffer, right? So whenever the instruction is not done yet. Well, so here's the thing. Y2 has to go to reorder buffer. First of all, again, when we finish two, one hasn't finished yet. So we have to finish the instructions in order still, right? So, but because one hasn't finished yet, if I write back instruction two, it will cause the problem that we previously mentioned, right? So what should we do? We have to put it into the reorder buffer, right? So for the reorder buffer, it means that all the results are stored temporarily, and there is a chance we can uh, revoke the institution of instruction two if you are still in real the buffer, right? So instruction two in the next cycle will be in real the buffer. But in the meantime, for instruction four, it's compare RDX and RDI. So it has nothing to do with instruction one and since instruction two is done and the LU is free, I can actually put instruction four in LU. So here, one thing interesting, right? So previously what we cannot do, but now we can do is instruction four it is now before instruction three. Instruction four is now before instruction three. Okay. So in the meantime, I keep decoding instructions. So I have five and six decoded. So now the instructions that has been decoded but not issued yet as three, four, uh, five, and six. So now in the next cycle, three, five, and six, who can I put in the pipeline? Three, five, and six. Who can I put in a pipeline? Who can I 
put in a pipeline. 356, who can I put in a pipeline? Three is depending on who. Instruction one. Is instruction one finished? No, so can I issue instruction three? Okay. How about five? In the next cycle. It depends on four, but in the next cycle, is four going to be finished? Yes, right? So I can actually execute instruction five, and it's going to be in the branch unit, right? How about instruction six? Can I issue instruction six in the next cycle? Why not? It doesn't depend on anyone. Right? Who is it depending on? It doesn't depend on anyone. Right? And M1, is M1 free? It is free. Right? So in the next cycle, you can actually execute 6 and 5 at the same time. But in the meantime, we haven't even finished 1 and 3. Right, so this is completely out of order execution. And in the previous cycle, we have done four. But again, because one is not finished yet, three is not finished yet. So both two and four, we have no idea if two and four is going to happen or not. Right, so they have to be in real the buffer. Right? And in the meantime, I'm also renamed two other instructions, seven and eight. So for seven and eight, their output will be pointed to physical register five and six. So in the future, anyone that is depending on five and six, oh uh, sorry, this uh, RBI and EAX, you should reference physical register five and six. Right? Okay, so now, I have three, seven, and eight here. Who can I put into execution next cycle? Seven. Seven? Okay, so seven is depending on RDI, but the RDI is now the RDI of two, right? And it's going to be in P2. If you check P2, it's valid, right? So there is no reason why you cannot put seven into execution, right? However, how about three? No, why not? Because P1 is still not ready yet, right? Okay, how about um, instruction eight? Is RCX EAX, ECX EAX, and ECX is now P4. So it's depending on six, right? And six is not even finished yet, right? So only seven, true? Okay, so next cycle, right? We got seven into the ALU stage. But in the meantime, one and six keep making progress, right? And last cycle, we got five finished, right? So five is also in the reorder buffer because one is not finished yet, three is not finished yet, right? Okay, so now we keep decoding instructions and renaming instructions. So now we have three, eight, nine, ten, four instructions in the reorder buffer. And um, for 9 and 10, because they don't have new output, so there is no physical register allocated for this two. And in the meantime, you can consider this RDX is pointing to P4, and this RDI is pointing to P5. So looking at this, um, okay, so for 3, 8, 9, 10, is there anyone we can issue in the next cycle? Three, why? One is done, right? In the next cycle, right? You can imagine that after M4, 
one is done, so P1 will be valid, and three could be issued immediately. All right? So three, and three is an LU instruction, so you can imagine three will be here, right? How about A910? Can we do nine? Okay, so for, ah, here we go, so this is wrong. So for here, it's depending on RDX, right? So who is producing RDX? RDX is simply a, an input, right? So we're only depending on RDI, right? So who is giving us the RDI? Seven, seven right? And seven? is going to be done here after this cycle, right? So in the next cycle, right, actually three. Uh, oh, you know, one interesting thing. For compare, right, for compare, it's also using ALU, right? Since you only have one ALU, you cannot actually put three and nine together because only one of them can get access to LU, and you should always give priority to an earlier one, right? So, unfortunately, both three and nine are possible, but we have to give priority to three, right? But in the meantime, right, we also have seven retired. So we have one, two, four, five, seven finished, right? And since one is finished, two can go away. Right? So what happened in the next cycle is that well, one and two will be retired, please, like officially retired from the pipeline. Right? Okay, so we know nine is available for institution, right? So, but in the meantime, we have A9, 10, 11, 12 in the renaming stage. So who else can we issue eight? Can we issue eight? No, right? So now nine is the head of the line. So we can definitely put nine here, right? So how about 10? No, because 10 is depending on nine. How about 11? Can we execute 11? Yes, right? Because 11 is depending on an RDI, which is generated here, and seven is already retired, right? So seven is retired, right? Because P5 is now valid, right? So you can actually use RDI, right? So, okay. So now, um, 11 can be done, right? So we got two instructions that's already issued, right? So we can issue nine and 11 in the next cycle, but in the meantime, six will advance to the next stage, right? And because one and two are gone, right now you have three, four, five, seven in your reorder buffer. And since three is done as well, right? In the next cycle, you, you can imagine three to five, they can all be retired from the pipeline, right? So. What happened in the next cycle? Now we have 8, 10, 12, 13, and 14. Can we get 8? Yes, right? Because 6 is going to be done next cycle. So 8 could be here. All right. 10, how about 10? Because nine is done, right? So 10 is here. Oh, sorry. 10 is here, right? So here's the thing, right? We got two instructions. So in the next cycle, it will be eight and 10. And three, four, five can be retired, right? So now you only have uh, six, seven, nine, 
right? But as you can imagine, since six is stuck, seven can be retired as well, right? So following the same philosophy, right? You will figure out that, oh, you know, like 11 is done and eight is done. So then you can see, you can project like eight, nine will be done, right? And if you keep going, this is pretty much what would happen, right? Do you have a feeling like, okay, following that, right? Every, every three cycle, I'm retiring five instructions, right? Every three cycles, I'm retiring five instructions. So that gives you a CPI of 0 0.6, right? So if you have register renaming logic for a two issue pipeline, it will give you 0 0.6 CPI which is very close to the optimal TPI, uh, CPI we can get is 0 0.5. Right? A lot better than a superscalar, right? Because with superscalar, we are just close to one, even though we are able to fetch and decode two instructions. So that's the power of register renaming. Okay, so you might feel like, okay, in the final, do I really have to draw the pipeline diagram as what I show? The answer is yes or no. There is an alternative way which I think is simpler, but they are both equivalent. Uh, so the second way is called using data flow analysis. So for this data flow analysis, this is also a method that I created, so you probably won't find it elsewhere. Um, so here you can you can create an instruction queue. And this is again the cycles. Right, and you have memory, you have LU, you have branch as your functional units that are available. And remember, we have a two issue pipeline. So only two of them can have instructions, right? Assuming that we only have one memory unit, one memory pipeline, one LU, and one branch, right? So uh, this comes too early. So here, Right, that's starting from this. So, assuming, uh, because the fetch is with perfect branch predictions, right, you can assume that we have a pretty smooth um, instruction front end, which consists of your instruction fetch and decode unit, right? So, right now we can skip that part, just focusing on the renaming and the, the issue. So, right now, assume that I rename two instructions each cycle, right? So I would have two instructions in a queue. So for instruction one and two, are they depending on anyone? No, right? So in the next cycle, I can safely put instruction one and two into execution. So for instruction one, it wants the memory unit, so I put it here. For instruction two, it is the LU, so I put it here. Now, the next cycle, I'm going to decode instruction three and four. So when is the earliest the time I can execute instruction three? So how many cycle I need for the data dependency of instruction three to be resolved? Four cycles, right? So four cycles after instruction one. So instruction one, two, three, four, right? So it will be uh, here, right? And instruction four, because it just depending on instruction two. So the cycle right after instruction two, I can already issue instruction four, right? Okay, how about instruction five and six? When is the earliest possible time I can execute instruction five? After four, right? So you can put it here, right? And it's going to use a branch unit, right? Because it's a branch instruction. How about instruction six? Who is it depending on? Two, right? So, which unit is it going to use? Memory unit, right? And 
when is the earliest time we can start executing instruction six? What? What? After one? After two, right? But right after two, could, we haven't finished decoding yet. All right, so you have to be one cycle later. That's the earliest of time. You can execute the instruction six, right? Agree? Question? Okay, so this is, okay, so this one is only representing, is only representing N1, right? So you can see the graph is pretty much like N1. So it's like we take N1, ALU, and BR to form these three columns, okay? So, Okay. Six. Now, we got seven and eight decoded. When is the earliest possible time we can start seven? Right after sleep what? As soon as it's decoded. As soon as, so seven is depending on who? Two, right? So it could actually start right next here, right? How about eight? Four cycles after six, right? So you can actually imagine what happened is seven here, right? And eight here, right? So this is actually misleading. So this is right, so this is wrong. Because seven is depending on two, not depending on four, okay? So now, six and eight, right? And eight is also depending on Three, right? Because you are you are depending on um, the EAX, right? Okay. So now, how about next cycle? We have nine and ten coming in. For nine, when is the earliest possible time we can just queue? After seven. After seven. How about ten? After nine, right? So after seven, you got nine, right? And the reason why we cannot do nine here is because there's already three here, right? So you can only postpone nine by a cycle, which is exactly the same thing happened when we draw the pipeline previously, right? And 10 is after this, right? So if you follow the same logic, here is the data flow graph, right? And you will find there is always some regularity here, right? And it's even easier to identify this than using the pipeline diagram. So this is actually the critical paths of your execution, right? So this is actually the sequence of critical paths. So the critical path is composed by the first six 11s and one plus five and instructions. So in fact, this is the critical path instruction of your pipeline execution. And again, because if you think about this, right? So from here, right, every, in between, on the critical path between 11 and 16, or 16 and potentially 21, right? Everyone is five cycles, uh, sorry, three cycles apart from each one, and there are five instructions in the middle. So again, you are going to get the same CPI as we previously evaluated, it's 0 0.6, right? So this is actually telling you this one is equivalent to the table that I just drew. And this is a lot easier to use. Okay? And I'm here to assure you 
this kind of question would definitely show up in your final as a comprehensive exam question. So if you cannot nail this one, you're not going to pass. Okay? I already tell you this is what I specifically want you to learn. Because every graduate level computer architecture class, the out expected outcome of a student is to know how to perform dynamic instruction scheduling on modern processor. So it's a very fair one to test. If you can't get it, you don't deserve, you don't deserve a master degree. All right? Question? OK, now you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> so the five comes from the fact that it's, it's the difference in number of instructions, because if we do one and six. Oh, no, when you see a steady state, right, six and 11, 11 and 15, right, they are all five apart. So, yeah, so uh, sorry, it's five instructions apart from each other, and three cycles apart from each other. How do we get the three cycles apart from each other? Is that because it's the four from memory? I mean, 11, well, three cycles, right? 11 is here, right? 16 is here. One, two, three. So this is three cycle, right? This is three cycle. You can imagine 21 will start here. Because you can see the regularity of this figure. Oh, so so because in the very beginning you are ramping up, okay. right? But without knowing the behavior of the ramping up and the steady state, it's hard for you to tell what's later on, right? So you definitely can. Well, when you draw the downfall diagram, there is no way you can skip the beginning. So CPI is how many instructions you can issue or finish, right, per cycle, right? So as long as you can issue this many instructions per cycle, right, like this one, right? Another way to tell is here, right? Here, you see the regularity, right? Every three cycles, we finish five instructions. That's why the CPI is 0 0.6, right? But for the data flow analysis, we are just doing a similar thing in a way that we are counting it by the issue rate, which is equivalent to the rate of vanishing, right? Even this is a pipeline. The rate you put stuff in the pipeline is also the rate you can get out of the from the pipeline, right? Are we good? Okay, nail the final exam. Now, I'm going to give you a few practice on this. So what about if we have a linked list, which instruction will become the critical path?
All right, let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay. So now, let's see. What do you guys think? So most of you think it's C. What is C? Okay, current equal to current next. But why? Why is C? Can I hear from you? Why is this C? Because it has to wait for like each, it's, it doesn't move in each iteration and it has to wait for the move to complete even though it's doing like more. Okay, stuff. so here's the thing, right? How do we implement this? Uh, B. Oh, no. Oh, how about A? <laughs> how about a do? Do. Alright, so how about B? It's just an add, right? So how about a C? You have a move, right? Which move from this one to this one. How about this one? Compare and jump, right? So, why is C instead of others? Because it takes four cycles and each one is dependent on the previous one. Because it takes four cycles, right? So this takes four cycles and this takes one cycle. And for the compare and jump, it simply takes two cycles, right? So, now, right, let's also verify this in data flow graph again, right? So, assuming that I have 16 instructions, and as you know that we have a smooth pipeline, uh, by any chance, can some of you lend me a pen and pencil? Because one thing that I identify is that we, again, have way more people voted than uh, people who didn't vote it. So this is already the second time that we have this in the class. So please sign your name. And uh, if there is anyone voted online, I identify. And uh, because this is the second time, I will send their names to the misconducting office for sure. The last time I didn't do it, but this time I will do it. Right? I mean, it's okay if you don't come. It's not okay if you come, if you don't come, but trying to get breaks for attendance. Okay, so, um, so here's the, here's the thing, right? So in the first cycle, so the, the 16 instructions that we have here, they are the dynamic instructions, which means the instructions that has been on road during the execution. So each iteration of your linked list is actually composed by exactly the four instructions that you guys said. First of all, we need a move, right? To perform uh, the pointer loading, right? And then we have an FL to count the number of nodes. And then we have a test that compare if this is a zero or not. And finally, we have a jump that goes back to the do. Right? So that's a, that's a linked list implementation, right? So in the first cycle, first cycle, we know, well, one and two, they can be student, and one is memory, the other is ALU. So how about three and four? When is the earliest possible time we can start three and four? When is the earliest possible time we can start three and four? What? Four is based on what? F. What? Three is depending on one, right? So four cycles after one. How about four? Four 
four is depending on three, right? Because branch or not is depending on the outcome of three, right? So three is here, four is here. How about six and five? When is the earliest possible time I can start six, pick five? When is the earliest possible time we can start five? What? One cycle after it started, or just right after it started. So who is five depending on? One, right? Because this is a pointer chasing, right? So you have to load the content in RDI plus eight, and this will create a new RDI for you, right? So what will happen is it has to wait also four cycles after one. So five is here, right? And again, six is depending on who. Two, right? So right after it's decoded or renamed, we can actually have six in a pipeline. Right? So if you keep drawing this data for diagram, this is what you will find. Right? So you find the regularity again. Right? Which part is regular? So this is again a critical path. Right? So it's one five, right? And who is one and five? The move instruction. Right, what that move instruction is implementing is actually the current equal to current next, right? It's actually the current equal to current next. So now the second question, given this is the pipeline, uh, sorry, data flow analysis, what's the average CPI of this piece of code? What's the average CPI? Let's wrap up in 15 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Okay. Okay. Looks like this time we only have 38 now. Okay. Five of them already got a message from their friends. Okay, but again, this time with the Facebook vote within this group, we see we definitely need a discussion. So why don't we just go ahead and discuss with your friends for another 90 seconds. So it's in those four. Except in the five three 
And four cycles per iteration. What's the CPI? One. one. So the answer is one. <laughs> what? It's already counted. Right? So one, two, three, four. Right? You have four instructions in the middle, right? One, two, three, four. You have four instructions in the middle. Yes? Shouldn't the 10 be lower because the 3 and 10 can be on the same Oh, can be lower, but does that matter? It's not on the critical path, so it doesn't matter at all. Right? Four instructions. So every iteration, you have this four instructions. Right? And every instruction starts four cycles. Every iteration starts four cycles after the other one. Right? So four over four is one. That's how you count the CPI. Sounds good? Okay. So the critical pass is this one, right? Okay, so let's take a look of the pipelines of modern processors. So this is the pipeline of Intel Skylake processor. You've probably already been able to read a lot of them. So there is a decode decoded iCache, which means that they have a cache for decoded instructions. And they have a branch prediction unit called BPU. They have an instruction cache. And they also have a legacy decode pipeline. So 
it's kind of interesting in in modern S86 pipeline, they have two stages of decoding. So one, the first stage is trying to decode from S86 to a risk-like instruction set that they use internally. So it's called micro ops, and those micro ops are indeed the instruction that will be sent into the instruction queue. So here you say it's called micro op queue instead of instruction queue. So when they schedule, they are scheduling the micro ops. And then this is the renaming, retire, reorder buffer logic, which is exactly the same thing. They also have a scheduler, which tries to schedule instruction into one of these functional units, right? One of these functional units. Right, so as you can see for this pipeline processor, right, uh, they have four functional units for the integer and four functional units for the memory. So this is actually a eight issue pipeline with four issue in the memory, four issue in the integer. This is this uh, this is another drawing of Skylake processor. Also tell you the same thing. Now. Uh, this is the latest Intel Elder Lake processor. As you can see, it's going even and more, even more crazy. So it has five issue LLU pipeline, but they also have a seven issue memory pipeline because memory is actually the slowest part in the processor. So you want to have as many uh, issues as possible in the memory instruction. So you can imagine the minimum CPI this processor can achieve is one over 12. So if you can program it in a way that you can leverage this 12 functional units concurrently, that's the lowest CPI. It's, it's even lower than 0 0.1. Uh, however, if you only have in, uh, integer instructions, you are going to get one over five. And with this integer functional units, only two of them can perform branch, uh, sorry, only two of them can perform branch. So, there, if you only have branch instruction, you can actually execute two at the same time. And uh, the, uh, the memory, if you only have memory instruction, you can execute seven concurrently. So the minimum CPI of memory instruction is actually one over seven in this pipeline processor. Um, so I will probably skip this one because it's too complicated. And this is the processor you have uh, you use for your homework, which is also uh, a diagram from the paper that has been assigned called the AMD Gen 3 processor. And as you can see, right, it also have an eight-way iCache, a branch prediction. Uh, again, because this is the uh, S86 processor, so they all they also have the uh, up cache, which and also they have um, and they call it's kind of interesting. They call the original S86 instruction as macro ops. So then in the up queue, you can put the micro ops. And there's a reason why they name like this is very silly because micro op is kind of being registered by Intel. So they, in, in, in AMD processor, they cannot really call it micro op in S86 instruction. So instead, they call it macro op in ops. Right, because you cannot register ops, so it's kind of silly, right? So, uh, so they dispatch this, and then you can see again they have four integer pipeline plus one additional branch and three issue memory pipeline. So this processor, if you count it CPI, right, the minimal the minimal CPI if you have one branch and four integer pipeline uh, in instruction and four mem uh, three memory instruction that are totally uh, dependent of each other, this is the minimum CPI you can get. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some interesting demo that's related to uh, our learning today. Okay, why is that asking me? Okay, so, so we have been showing a code of linked list, right? So a lot of cases, algorithm teacher would give you a lot of benefit, would, would tell you a lot of good things about linked list, but actually I want to tell you that in terms of performance, linked list is, is a disaster. And in fact, a lot of my friends that work in game companies, they would never use linked list because 
like this is just way too slow to allow you have the real time experience in your game. So that's why you see there are typically a lot of bugs in online games, especially when you have a lot of a lot of people in the game because they are using array to store anything, everything. So if everything, if you are inter uh, inter uh, interfacing an like array out of one error, that's the time that your game will crash. And it happens again and again. But as a game player, we know this is happening all the time. So we would just restart again and just think it's a bummer, right? But in fact, the developer intentionally do this because if we have, if we use a linked list, then you are not even going to play the game very well. So the thing is that, okay, so here's the code that I wrote. So I have two functions. One is both of them are counting the depths of an array or a linked list. And the main uh, loop that you can see here is that they are they are pretty much the same, right? They are pretty much the same. Just count if this node is a has a next, and if it has a next, I do node number of nodes plus plus. So here I'm going to run it with a very small case. So with only four k nodes. What you can Im imagine is that everything would fit in the cache. So, and because I already initialized everything. So everything would fit in the cache, you would imagine no cache misses. Right? So the only thing that would make the difference is the instruction sequence. Now, if you look at that, right, and then let's perform a com performance comparison. Okay, right? The linkless version is the bottom one. So even though, well, actually I, I'm wrong, okay. Uh, let me see, let me do it again. Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. With 4K nodes, it seems like we still have uh, quite a lot uh, in structure cache misses. Wait, okay, did I get it right? Okay, here we go, right? So, okay, looks like looks like this time is a little bit more realistic. Okay, but it's kind of interesting, right? Even for 4K, uh, this data still cause quite a lot at one D cache misses because the pattern of access is kind of a re re irregular instead of a regular. So L1 D cache misses is also a lot. The branch prediction is actually not different too much because most of the time you are just predicting is is going to be taken because uh, only one node is going the one last node is going to be not taken, right? So the branch is actually pretty easy to predict. However, because of uh, the the memory instruction is missing a lot of cases, right? So it makes the critical path instruction becomes really long, right? So it turns out your CPI is a lot worse in the case of a linked list. Right? Your 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 yeah it's a lot worse in the linked list. Right? So that's why you get performance hit on this one. Right? So if you compare the implementation, right, the linked list implementation is exactly the one that I show you here, four instructions between L3 and in fact, the array version is actually longer. Well, because it has five instructions here. It has five instructions here. Right. However, if you check the performance, right? Okay, it's actually a lot different. Right? Okay. So um, right now we know that you know modern processor architectures has this characteristics. So first of all, no matter if it's Intel or AMD processor, though they all have multiple issue pipelines with multiple functional units available. And um, all of them has cache and branch predictions. So now the question is that how are we going to utilize that to improve performance? So uh, now I'm going to give you an example called pop count. So I know a lot of you like Lake Hope, right? So 
before I go into the legal format of pop count, let me show you pop count is an application, uh, an algorithm that counts how many bits in a number are ones. So why would we want to do that? Because in our case, we want to do parity checks or uh, error correction code, uh, cryptography, uh, sparse matches multiplication, uh, fingerprinting, or uh, a lot of data structure. They want to use big vectors. So this application is actually a lot. This application is really a lot. So here's the format of pop count. Saying that I have a 64-bit integer number, finding, uh, I format the question like this, find the number of ones in this binary representation. So for example, if you have this particular number, right, its binary representation is this. So there are seven ones in the binary representation, right? So I'm going to give you this driver program. What you need to do is to implement the pop count function that gives me the best performance. Now, I have five options for you. Which one is the best? We can assume they all work, right? All they all work. <laughs> Don't worry about that. wrap up in 15 seconds. Unrolling is good. Uh, less 
no less branches. branches or no branches, right? If I can unroll all sitting branches, there will be uh, there won't be any branches, yeah. right? And how about the memory access? How about the data dependencies? There's less. <laughs> <laughs> There's less. <laughs> All right. So we can definitely talk about the detail in the next lecture. But you know, before you leave the classroom, you definitely want to know the answer, right? So let's run it right now. So here's a pop count, and. Again, this is a program, and we have several different implementations. So this is the implementation A, while loop, and the second one is also a while loop, but we do manually unroll, right? The third one is also a while loop. We do it on roll, but instead of uh, doing four of this we make it a table, lookup table, right? And for the version D, we have a constant loop and make a lookup table, right? And for the final one, well, we, have a, we also have a constant loop, but instead of using a lookup table, we use a switch statement, right? So who has the best performance? Uh, so now let's run it. Okay. So okay. So for this one, I'm making all of them with uh, the optimization flag three, which is a very optimized one, and um, then I time each other. Right? So, ah, finally, right? 23 seconds later, I got version A. Right? Now we are waiting for version B. Is it still running? Okay, there is a star, so it's still running. Okay, version B, right? Twice faster than version A. 12 seconds, right? For version C, okay, 5 seconds, a lot better. Version D, even faster, 3.7. Right? And let's look at version E. Version E is still running. It's still running. Do you feel like you are watching a car racing or something? <laughs> you know, last weekend I was at the Pentacle Park. I was watching uh, like baby racing. So it's very difficult to control. And you know, within this like, you know, between the game, right? There is all, between each inning of the game, you only have like two minutes. So sometimes you are thinking, are they able to finish this in two minutes? For now, like I only have one minute left in my class, but you know, we have been talking a lot and I'm running out the, the words, but E hasn't finished yet. Okay, so maybe we can come back later, but in the meantime, right? In the meantime, I do have a few things that I want to let you know. So the first two things you probably know, and the third thing is a it's a chance that you will get bonus for your Jupyter Notebook. So the IEVAL, which is the teaching evaluation, will start next Monday. So if you think this is a good class, you like our teaching, you like to fill it out, uh, do it, and don't forget to take a screenshot and submit it through, through Grace Go. I will give you 100 credit for a notebook assignment. So a lot of you were criticizing, well, the TA's grading of Jupyter Notebook is terrible or something. This is your good chance to get, get rid of another of them, right? So don't forget to submit that. <laughs> but in the meantime, let's see if D finishes. Is it finishing? Oh no, is D finishing? Do we see D somewhere? No! It's okay. It crashes. It's longer, right? So D is terrible. Alright, that's all we know. Alright, so I'll see you next. Uh, okay, so assignment 3 due this Thursday, not Friday, and reading quiz due next month, Tuesday. So shift it one day. Okay, I got this wrong. Uh, so this is, this is tonight, this is next Tuesday. 
right? So there's no extension, by the way. All right. Other than that, see you next week.